This evening we're going to, as I've already mentioned, uh, just follow up on kind of what we were looking at this morning by looking at a passage that I referenced this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 10, but what I'd like to do is begin reading from uh, verse 1. Um, this is what uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and, and here he's giving a little bit of some interesting insight into his background. Uh, what the Lord revealed to him, a great revelation that he saw, and then what the Lord did to him, uh, essentially to help him be strong in the Lord. So this is what we read beginning in verse 1. He says, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord bless his word to our building up in Christ this evening. Well, Paul tells us here of what we, I think we would consider a remarkable experience that he had 14 years earlier when he was caught up into heaven. And what he means, of course, by the third heaven is not just the sky we see, not just the celestial heavens, but the heavens in which the Lord dwells. And there he heard words that were so inexpressible, that is so sacred, that he was not allowed to repeat them, uh, likely because this revelation was for Paul and for him alone. Now on the surface, his experience here looks quite a bit like uh, Isaiah's experience when he was lifted up to the throne room of God and when he saw and heard things that were so deeply convicting that he thought he would be destroyed, uh, but for the Lord's mercy. We actually have a few instances in Scripture where the Lord uh, brings his prophets into his secret council chambers, as it were, to prepare them for the ministry in which he is calling them. Now, the interesting thing here is that it appears to have had the opposite effect on Paul that it had on Isaiah, whereas Isaiah, when he was in the council chambers of God and he saw these things, he immediately cried out and pronounced a curse on himself, woe is me, knowing that apart from the grace of God, he would be destroyed. On the other hand, Paul seems to actually have enjoyed his experience and was somewhat uh, restrained from maybe boasting about this experience. And I think this is perhaps one of the differences that the gospel makes. In the Lord Jesus Christ, the, uh, the terror that we might otherwise experience in the presence of God is replaced with a different kind of spirit, and that is the spirit of sonship. Those in Christ who stand before the Father see him as a uh, basically a heavenly father, as a God of, of love and not a God of justice. Well, after Isaiah was initially struck by his own sin, uh, the Lord graciously removed it with a coal from the altar, remember, foreshadowing, I believe, the work of our Lord Jesus that allowed him to stand 
in the Lord's presence. Paul's reaction, having already been cleansed by the Lord Jesus Christ, seems to be simply one of amazement, just that he was, he was just overwhelmed that he had such a great privilege that had been bestowed on him. Now, because of this great privilege, the Lord afflicted Paul with what he calls a thorn in the flesh, what he also refers to as a messenger of Satan, which we don't know exactly what this was, but it appears to have been some kind of physical difficulty. It could have been some kind of physical affliction or maybe even the persecution that he lists here that was inflicted on him or perhaps in, inspired or controlled by one of uh, Satan's messengers, one of his angels, by the Lord's permission, as he did in the case of Job. Remember, Satan or his angels are always on a leash, as it were, and they can't do anything to us beyond what the Lord actually allows. And of course, whenever the Lord allows it in the lives of his people, it's always for their good. This particular affliction was to keep Paul from exalting himself because of the privileges that he had received. I want you to think, contrast that with what we see today with regard to those who believe themselves to have received divine revelation. They usually capitalize on these supposed experiences and use it to draw a large following and to make a lot of money. They use it to sort of exalt themselves rather than to humble themselves. Well, the Lord was protecting Paul by humbling him so that he would not be tempted to sin. Paul asked the Lord three times that he might remove this affliction, but the Lord said he wouldn't because of its gracious purpose. This wasn't meant to hurt Paul. It was meant to help him. The Lord answers him in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul understood that. And so he responded, as we should all respond when the Lord sends these kinds of helps in, in our direction. Verses 9 and 10. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul sees these difficulties as a good thing, not a bad thing. Because the greater they were, the weaker he saw that he was, and the more he looked to the Lord to find his strength. And really, I think the point I want us to see this evening is simply this, that if we would find the Lord's strength, we have to first be emptied of our own strength. It's when we're weak, at least weak in the way the world would define it, that we are strong. Our Lord Jesus really wants us to see things as, as they are because that is what will help us. And tonight he particularly wants us to see the things that will hurt us and the things that will help us with regard to serving him and being strong in him. And to summarize all of this, basically, it's just another way of putting it, we must not pursue the things of the world and the things that the world believes will make us strong, but rather the things the Lord says will make us strong. And we want to see why they will make us strong. I think we understand by now the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world are opposed. They're opposed in virtually every way. The things that people value in this world really have no value in God's eyes or in his kingdom, uh, and vice versa. The, the world does not value what is in the kingdom of heaven. There's a reason why the Lord's kingdom is called the kingdom of light and Satan's the kingdom of darkness. The two are as different as day and night. One is good, the Lord's kingdom, and the other is evil. And the same thing applies when we go to find the Lord's strength or uh, the kind of strength that we would want to find in order to do what the Lord calls us to do. We're going to have to find it in the way the Lord tells us we need to find it, the way that Paul found it and not in the way the world would pursue it. Uh, one of the sad realities today is, is that many who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are typically seeking the things of the world 
because they believe that they're valuable and they're going to be able to essentially do with those things what the Lord wants them to do, that they will give them some kind of advantage. And it's really not surprising because all of us were born into this world. We're born into the same world. Many of us were raised like the rest of the world were raised, like those who aren't believers. Perhaps we were raised by unbelieving parents, and we were certainly raised with the children of this world. At least many of us weren't. Some of us weren't. Uh, so to many of us, the world really has seemed like the norm. And it's really been difficult perhaps for some of us to see it as anything other than that. At least it is until we get into the scriptures and we begin to come to grips with what the Bible actually says. If we were blessed by the Lord to be raised by Christian parents, which some of us have actually here, we might have escaped some of these things in our youth, but eventually we have to come in contact with the world and the world will seek to influence us in a particular direction. Now John, as you know, in 1 John 2, 15 through 16, tells us what these influences are that we need to watch out for that are not good for us. He says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Well, what do you mean by this? Well, he goes on to tell us, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. This is essentially a summary of, of the world system, of the things that Satan is working in this world to draw men away from the Lord. And certainly that's what they want, to be away from the Lord. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of of life. We're going to see these are just the opposite of what the Lord wants for us. John tells us that these things are not from the Father. And he says that if we love these things, we don't love the Father. The love of the Father is not in us. Again, because the world and the Father are opposites, and to love one is not to love the other. And he goes on to tell us in verse 17 that if we embrace the world, Far from being to our advantage, it will actually be to our detriment because if we embrace it, we will actually be destroyed with it. But if we embrace the Father through Jesus our Lord and do what he says is right, we will find blessing. In verse 17, he says this, the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So, if we're going to seek strength, if we're going to seek blessing, if we're going to uh, really draw upon those resources that we were reminded, that Dr. Ferguson reminded us of in that series, Lessons from the Upper Room, from the Vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one we are attached to is the branches. If we are to draw down those blessings, we need to seek, we need to seek those things in the way the Lord says will be to our advantage. We need to seek the things that will strengthen us. Now, we don't have time to look at everything in the Bible about that, obviously, but let's take a look at a few things from the Sermon on the Mount, particularly uh, the Beatitudes. And again, reminding you from the two different perspectives, what would the world think about a person who actually has these characteristics and qualities within them? And what does the Lord think of them? To the world, they are considered a group of weaknesses that they want nothing to do with. But to the Lord, they are strengths. Well, Jesus says uh, in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is the path to strength? What is it that the Lord wants to see in us? Well, he wants to see humility. That we see our own emptiness. That we see our complete dependence upon him. He doesn't want to see in us self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And this might actually be a summary of everything that uh, the Lord has to say on the subject. But he goes on to expand it a little bit more. By the way, I should also mention that on another occasion, Jesus put it this way in Luke 6.20, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's interesting that James tells us in James 2, verse 5, 
that Jesus likely has in mind here actual, uh, what would you want to say, material poverty. He writes this, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Those who have a lot of wealth tend to look to their wealth to meet their needs. Those who don't have a lot of wealth look to the Lord. So this is something else the Lord wants us to see in us. He wants to see a rich faith, not a rich bank account. Uh, Jesus goes on in Matthew 5, verse 4. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Lord wants to see within us grief and humility for our sins. He doesn't want to see a self-justifying attitude, thinking that we've done nothing wrong. I'm, I'm a relatively good person. He wants us to be humbled by our sins. In the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, remember they both went up into the temple to pray. The Pharisee was looking up to God saying, what a wonderful guy I am. Not like this person here. And the tax collector beating on his breast said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He was the one who was grieving over his sins. Blessed are those who mourn. Jesus said of him in Luke 18, 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, note how the kingdom of heaven is just the opposite of the world. The Lord says he wants a meek and gentle spirit, not a forceful and abrasive one. He says in verse 5 of Matthew 5, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. He wants us to hunger and thirst or to desire righteousness, to, to see our spiritual bankruptcy so that we would desire the perfect obedience, the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants us to desire, not the honors of the world, not the pleasures of the world, not the wealth of the world. Jesus says in verse 6 of Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. The Lord wants within us not hearts that hate and seek revenge on our enemies, but he wants us to be those who are moved by uh, the, the afflictions or the needs of those around us. Again, think the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan when the man asked uh, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, well, this is what a neighbor is supposed to do. You know, if you see your enemy in need, take care of him like the Samaritan did, the Jew. It's interesting that he put the Samaritan in the position that he did of being able to help and the Jew in need rather than the other way around. At what could be perhaps more striking or maybe more offensive to the Jew than that. But Jesus says, you be like the Samaritan. You know, have a heart of mercy. He says in verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The Lord desires hearts in which the power of sin is broken, that have been purified by grace, not hearts that are bound up by sin. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Lord wants us to be those who sow the seeds of peace, who work to reconcile those who are at odds with one another, rather than being those who widen divisions. Jesus says in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the Lord wants us to be those whose lives are so transformed by his grace, that we become so much like Jesus, that it draws the hatred of the world, rather than being those that simply blend into the background and are indistinguishable from the world. Jesus says in verses 10 through 12, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Dr. Ferguson reminded us this past Wednesday that the world didn't crucify Jesus Christ because he was the same 
as they were, but because he was different. And if we become like him, Jesus was telling his disciples, you're going to be hated in the same way that I was. But this is exactly what he calls us to be, which in the eyes of the world, again, is weakness. Now, the question we need to ask is, why are all these things the world considers to be weaknesses? And I think we understand why they believe them to be weaknesses, but why are these actually strengths? Why do they help us rather than hurt us the way, again, the world would think they might? Well, it's because every one of these things that the Spirit of God is working in us, every one of these things that the Lord brings into our lives, uh, either by way of afflictions, you know, persecutions, insults, distress, and so forth, or physical afflictions. All of these things are meant to get us to look away from ourselves because they show us our weaknesses, to look to God for His strength and His resources, to be able to draw on Him or draw from Him those things that He has promised. Again, think about what Paul says in our passage. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. He says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And again, consider how all of these things basically get us to look up rather than to look down or to look in. If we have this true poverty of spirit, this true humility, this sense of our own emptiness, where are we going to look in order to be filled? But to the Lord Jesus, because he's the only one who can do this. If we don't have uh, the resources that we need, if we don't have large reserves of money, where are we going to look when we are faced with need? We're going to look to him because that's really the only place we can look. Grief and humility for our sins will make us look to Jesus to be right with God and not to our works. We realize that our works fail in every single way. And again, humility, grief, mourning over our sins, this humility and shame for sin reminds us that it's always him. It's always Jesus. It can't be us. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness causes us to look to Jesus, to be satisfied. That's what this hungering and this thirsting is all about, is looking to Him. Where hungering and thirsting after the things of the world just makes us look to the world and not to Him. Having a merciful heart shows that we really have looked to the Lord for His mercy and that we have His mercy and will continue to receive his mercy. Really, all these virtues show that we have looked to the Lord and that we have His grace and His mercy in us. But having a merciless heart shows that we haven't. Having our hearts purified by grace gives us a stronger desire to see God. And the fact that we desire it so strongly, the Lord is going to give that to us. But having a corrupt heart makes us avoid Him. So a heart purified by grace makes us look up and not to the world. Being peacemakers, again, I think shows that the character of God's being formed in us because He is the ultimate peacemaker. He sent His Son into the world in order to reconcile us to Himself. And He makes us to be peacemakers just like Him to bring men to Him that they might be reconciled while those who create and widen divisions basically show themselves to be in the kingdom of darkness because Satan is the ultimate the ultimate destroyer of unity. And of course, finally, being attacked by those in the world makes us look to God for his protection and his strength to endure. I mean, the Lord brings into our lives things that are stronger, as it were, the beyond our resources, beyond our ability to deal with, so that we will look to him. He brings us to a place of weakness so that we will look to Him for strength. You know, the Lord can even use the physical afflictions that He brings into our lives to drive us to Himself. I mean, we, we saw that a bit this morning about our worries and our cares and concerns. Whenever we 
are faced with something, we always assume the worst. We always get anxious about it. We always become fearful. But that is really meant to drive us to the Lord. It drives us outside of ourselves, outside of our ability to cope with it. We look to him for his mercy. So all the difficulties that the Lord brings, even the difficulties that he shows us about ourselves, again, think grieving and mourning over sin, poverty of spirit, they're all designed by him to drive us out of ourselves, away from self-sufficiency in order to create in us a Christ-sufficiency. And so essentially what we need to do is learn to see things as the Lord sees them and not as the world sees them. And we need to pursue the things that the Lord says are good, the things that he values, the things he says to our advantage, and not the things that the world says are to our advantage. It's because when we are weak and we perceive ourselves as weak, that we are strong because we look to him and to his resources rather than our own. And that's where we need to be looking if we are to do what the Lord has called us to do, if we are to live the kind of life he calls us to live, if we are to have strong faith that looks to him, that removes all the fear and gives us the peace that we all would love to have in the Lord Jesus and actually is there for us if we will simply look to him. So may the Lord show us our weakness and use these things to drive us to him so that we may be strong in the Lord. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's uh, ask the Lord to help us be able to um, accept this and to be able to apply it.